So good evening everyone, welcome. We've been discussing the uh, Namastakam of Rupa Goswami. Shri Rupa Goswami, Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Shri Namastakam Ki Jai. Jai. Hari Nam Prabhu Ki Jai. Jai. God Premanam Di. Tonight we come to the eighth verse, seventh verse, and the eighth verse as, as well. And um, I don't think I'll speak at too much length on these verses, hopefully leaving some time for questions, but it may lead us um, in areas heretofore unknown. So, <laughs> um, as you know, very uh, briefly, to recap, uh, as we come to the end now of the Namastakam there, Namastakam of eight prayers, glorifying the holy name, and um, they're written all in different meters, which would seem odd, but they're all in feminine meters, and the implication of that is that Krishna, who's not different in his name, is encircled by the eight principal gopis who make him shine uh, that much brighter, make him known, make him available. There was some discussion about Shakti the other day, some questions from Pranada to me and of Maharaj as well, and of course, it's the it's it's by the shakti of a person or their energy that we really know about them. It's what it's what they do, what they're about. And so by knowing the shakti of Bhagavan, then we'll know Bhagavan. We'll know if we know about the Maya shakti, we'll know it's 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 inert unto itself. So it needs a, a conscious activator. So. It's, it's, it's not coming in the wrong way. Okay. Well, there you go. So, again, right, for example, if we, as a conscious being, we explore, examine the nature of the field before us, uh, that our our body and mind, for that matter, are, are constituted of, um, the tendency is to look for a source. Hmm. The world has a beginning, then uh, it must have a... Uh, well, a cause, right? So, anyway, by studying the material nature, we can know something about <laughs> God. He is, as we learn from the Gita, the seed-giving Father, Hambija Pradapita, makes the, activates the machine of material nature and makes the world go around. Hmm? And, and in doing so, that seed is the, the jivas them, themselves. So that's the us, another shakti. Hmm? And um, and both of us, the maya shakti, jiva shakti, have Krishna as, as uh, the Godhead as our source, a form of the Godhead, say, let's say the Paramatma, and he has a source if we keep going, and so forth. So and what makes his world go round? We figure, he, as the Paramatma, he makes this world go around indirectly by way of witnessing and sanctioning hmm, the movements of the jivas and the response of material nature, which is karma. So he's just. Hmm. Um, as Paramatma, witness and justice. Hmm. He cannot ignore material nature. He doesn't have a direct relationship with her, but he cannot ignore her, entirely override her, and then there would be no justice. And if there's no justice, what's the problem? Then there could be no mercy. There has to be justice in order for there to be mercy, because justice is an overriding of the mercy. Hmm? Excuse me, excuse me. So mercy is, excuse me, excuse me. mercy is overriding of of justice. <clears throat> so we have a just, a just feature of the Godhead, hmm? 
but we see in the world that some people appear blessed also. Uh, so we may wonder about that. And of course, that is the influence of his Swarup Shakti in the form of the devotees. Well, there's the influence of karma in the world. There's also the influence of bhakti in the world since a time without beginning. Indeed, that what's, that's what brings Bhagawan to the world of the Paramatma. The bhakti, mature bhakti in the hearts of devotees who are interested, who have having attained the mercy, so to speak, of Bhagawan, are interested in something, interested in that, <laughs> in his merciful nature, rather than his just nature. And this comes to the full force in the personhood of Krishna and what makes his world go round. It is that very, really compassionate nature that sometimes Radha is said to uh, personify. So I've just given some example. By knowing the Shakti, we'll know something about Bhagavan and particularly his 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 Swarup Shakti, the Bhakti is is constituted of. So surrounded Harinam is by his internal energy. Hmm? And particularly the Gopikas and Radha uh, making his love life go around. And that then invo- implies other assisting sentiments and so forth, that it may all fully play itself out to the full measure, of, for example, of parakia. You can't have parakia if you haven't got some non-consenting parents mm-hmm. mm, and some friends who can cover for you mm, and um, help to ma- make the rendezvous happen. Mm. Um, so, um, so Harinam, non-different from Krishna, he's liberated, he worships by liberated souls, and all well and good, but all the better that we heard in the second verse, he comes to the world, though he's liberated, beyond even the reach of the Upanishads, beyond the crown jewel of the sounds of the Upanishads, he shines very brilliantly, yet comes to the lowest part of the world in the form of syllables that can be uttered even nonchalantly, even without fully understanding, without any sambandhagyan, without understanding his shaktis, and there will be extraordinary results, right? We heard not only can aparabdha karma be destroyed, but kriyamana karma, or karma that you would create in this life, you won't create. You, you, you could do away with, I should say. And um, and by Nama Bas, also you can get some Bhakti Unmukhi Sukriti, which will make you psychologically disposed towards understanding the Gaudiya, for example, way of looking at the scriptures. It'll just make sense to you. That's got to be the right interpretation, even though there are other schools and so forth, even non devotional interpretations of similar verses. So the reason that we they, they resonate with us is because of some predisposition that's created by Bhakti Devi herself in the form of, as the example I'm giving, Rupa Goswami gives of, of an Abbas, a shadow of the name. Hmm? But of course, uh, there is also the problem of the Prabhda Karma, which is more, it's like I said, the email, it's already been sent. You can't get it back. Uh-oh. Hmm? So imagine if you could get an email back that you sent it. You didn't mean to press send. That would be a pretty powerful tool. Hmm? So Harinam chanted with faith and supported by some Sambandagyan hmm? has the power to do away with the Prabhda Karma and also therefore liberate us in this life, gradually, in due, in due course. That's what we call Bhava Bhakti, right? And so these are some powerful effects of the name, but then we learned there is even more powerful effects of the name, and that is what? That uh, going forward, they also the name Harinam Guru also has the power to do away with greater problems than our parabda. Parabda 
and other types of karma and in different stages is all of our happiness and distress. That's what it is. Hmm. So you can do away with all our happiness and distress. You have to understand, of course, happiness in the world leads to distress, leads to happiness, leads to distress. Hmm. Two sides of the same coin. Happiness that is derived from attachment, hmm, acquisition, is the womb from which suffering is born because you can't keep it. Hmm. Just to give a simple example, as Krishna does in the Gita, Shashvatam, what is it? Uh, Dukalayam, Ashashvatam. In two words, he sums up the whole affair. It's misery of suffering, an abode of suffering, and and it's temporary. So even if you like it or you think you do, you can't you can't keep it. So the happiness turns to distress. Hmm? Even if you can keep it, if you become rich, then you have become nervous. Hmm? One time a devotee gave me a ring, a ring with a um, yellow sapphire. Hmm? It's kind of Jupiter influence astrologer devotee. So you wear it on the on the Jupiter finger, but it was an, a fairly expensive jewel, and it made me always apprehensive. I've got this like thousand dollars on my finger. I'm always poor, as you may know. <laughs> and uh, so I, I found it was making giving me anxiety. I had I had it. I hadn't lost it. It was still giving me anxiety. Just a finish the story on that. <laughs> One day I was feeding cows and cleaning the barn <laughs> and I had I had lost a little weight and it went off my finger like that into the into the hay somewhere. I got lost. <laughs> went to Goloka, I guess. It's a, it's a chintamani there in the hay, right? You can, what do you will find? So <laughs> <laughs> So, so anyway, <laughs> so even if you have acquisition and you can keep them for a fairly long time, it can cause you a lot of anxiety. So, uh, so this is aiming the whole range of material happiness and distress. This is all the karma influence, and um, e- even in the Yoga Sutra, the kleshas, the same concept that we find in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, for example, suffering. Happiness in Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, the material happiness is included in the sesha, in the kleshas. So it's a way of saying the, the, the same thing. But there, uh, besides uh, these um, karmic problems, if you will, hmm, it's allotted suffering and happiness that we have to endure and uh, and that we perpetuate and so forth. Um, there's a greater problem, and that is. Other than sins of the flesh, there are the sins of the soul. So this means aparad. So when you go against the bhakti, it's one thing to steal, to be an adulterer, to be as bad as you could be, to be sinful. And it's a whole other thing to offend Bhagawan, bhakti. Hmm? So that's why the reactions... And the anart the accruing from aparad, and the anarthas, so to speak, that they, they cause a blockage to our progress, derived from aparad, they carry all the way into bhava bhakti. So bhava bhakti is a liberated condition. It's kind of the the equal of, for the jnanis sense of jivan mukta to be a jivan uh, jivan mukta, liberated in the in the body. Uh, in Bhava Bhakti uh, for devotees. So, but but the reaction from offenses, uh, anarthas arising out of them, can carry into Bhava Bhakti because they're of a spiritual nature. So they can, they they're more enduring. Hmm? They will go away. They have their time. There's uh, and they'll clear, and suddenly someone will reappear. Well, in the Bhava Bhakti, it's different, but. Um, sometimes by offenses we we see the devotee comes and he's always around he can never join hmm? Hmm. he likes it he understands it he can never join this is means Vaishnava Parat in the previous life but in time it will pass especially if he doesn't 
succumb to a samskar for that and offend in this life further. That happens sometimes, unfortunately. But if he doesn't and serves um, advanced devotees, then it will pass. And suddenly, it's as if some invisibly some blockage has been lifted. This can happen to us, as I was saying the other night, to karmically also, in different respects. I knew a guy, he was a devotee, uh, is a devotee, he was a truck driver. Hmm? That's, uh, you know, not a highly, doesn't require a lot of education, and he didn't have that kind of aptitude. And I met him one day, and he was a physicist. Hmm? <laughs> he became a physicist. I couldn't believe it. It was very interesting. So I looked at it like, oh, a certain, a certain parabda had karma had exhausted itself, and he became, <laughs> became an intellectual. It was quite startling to me. <laughs> so, uh, so at any rate, um, then Harinam also we learn has the power to do away with offenses, and we talked about the fact that it has offense ability to do away with offenses to Bhagwan. So, in the sixth uh, verse of Namastakam, Rupa Goswami explained that there are two forms the form of Bhagwan and the form of the name of Bhagwan. And of the two, which are non-different, there's still a difference. The difference being that the name is more generous, more merciful than the named. The implication of which is if you offend the, the person of the Godhead, Bhagwan, the name will stay with you and rectify hmm, through chanting any offense committed to the person or the form of Bhagwan. We gave a nice example of the Brahma Vimohan Leela, where Brahma offended Krishna. His offense was very slight, actually. Um, he wanted to test the power of Krishna. He was almost suspicious. Is, is this actually the same, my guru, who I saw at the dawn of creation? There he was dressed like a gopa, which is not very sophisticated, but he was speaking very eloquently uh, Sanskrit verses and enlightened me, enlightening me with the essential four verses of the Bhagavatam. His hand was held in the Gyan Mudra hmm, of a teacher giving blessings. Hmm. I saw Narayan, who's my source, and then he appeared as, uh, in this form. So I thought, this is the Vasudeva Krishna. He comes from Narayan. He's my guru. Now I've come to Brind- to Brindavan because something extraordinary happened and the gods have notified me hmm, about it. Agasura, sin itself, hmm, in the form of a python, hmm, has been liberated. And the way he was liberated is that he merged into the form of Krishna. Hmm. He attained ultimately what's called Sarupya Mukti. So Brahma could understand he got a form like Narayan, that's Sarupya Mukti, and entered into Bhagavat Sauja. Hmm. He entered the form of Bhagavan Krishna and got a form like Narayan. The, the subtle implication is wait a minute, that kind of looks like. Krishna, Narayan is an aspect of Krishna hmm? rather than the other way around. So maybe, what's happening here? And that he, this is his kind of questioning. And then he, then Krishna, of course, begins to entertain him, himself and his friends with pointing out the different uh, wonders of the forest and then taking their picnic lunch, the scene of which is very, very sweet and charming, and Krishna's not holding his hand like this in the Gyan Mudra. Hmm? In fact, he's he's taking yogurt and rice from another cowherd's plate and mouth and holding it in his left hand. Hmm? And so, looks like my guru, but he's acting kind of weird. <laughs> He's acting in an unbecoming way. This is Vidhi, Brahma, who is like the personification of all the, the rules of the Veda. Hmm? He knows he knows how to. He's got the form down. Hmm? 
but Krishna is now acquainting him with some substance mm-hmm. Hmm, where the form then plays out in a way that it bewilders even the people of Vaikuntha who say, you can't do that. You can't sit on top of God, wrestle him to the ground. You can tie him to a mortar. Huh? You shouldn't even do that to an ordinary child. <laughs> uh, this is this is this is form over substance. That is Golok. The other day it was it was mentioned that somebody said that the devotees here are not very well trained or even the very nice, well behaved. Arad and asked, sometimes I think we, I don't know the, how to do things right, the, all the details and so forth. Hmm. I went along with her and I spoke kind of generously about that, as if to say she was rather humble. I took a humble position also. Yes, we are not very well trained up here in so many details. That's that, that's true. But... but we don't criticize the inhabitants of Vrindavan and, and teach that they fall from there. Hmm. What does it mean to be trained up? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're not trained up. They don't know how to respect me. Hmm. Somebody needs training in substance over form, right? And yes, so some of you uh, younger people may not act like we did in 1973. Uh, And and the 1973 there says, thank God, right? There you go. So what does it mean to be trained up, right? Mm -hmm. And as far as form goes, so if you are the example of being trained up, please recite to us, what are the 32 offenses to the deity in Seva Parad? Because offending the form of Bhagavan, hmm, besides an example like like Brahma, I didn't finish that, but he, he offended, so he thought, you know, is this really my guru, or is this an imposter? So, by thought, he very subtly, but he, he offended Krishna, and then he t- tried to steal Krishna's calves and coward boys to, just to test him, to see. Hmm? And of course, the reaction from this was, in the long term, Shiva Vrnichin Uttam Sharanyam, as the Bhagavatam says. In Gaur Shiva and Brahma also come. As Mahavishnu of Advaita Charja and his his disciple, Brahma Haridas, as, as Advaita referred to him. Hmm? So what's the point? The point is, he offended the form of Krishna, but he took, and so he had to take birth out of form. <laughs> he, 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 <laughs> right? He was now a Muslim. He was an outcast. He didn't know the right way to do things. He didn't know what to eat with one hand and not the other, and and so forth. I, I'll tell you a quick story about that. One of my godbrothers told me that he was he had an opportunity to go with Prabhupada and some other. Um, sannyasis to a luncheon I think it was in Bombay by one life member in Iskand many years ago was wealthy and invited one of the Prabhupada to come to his house and have lunch so they, they went and so he, he served out the, the, the meal and so forth and the man was watching and watching and watching and then um, finally when the devotees began to eat he said oh I now I know they are Vaishnavas hmm? I know they are pure and they all looked at him. He's telling Prabhupada. He said, "Could they reading with their right hand?" Hmm. <coughs> they all kind of. They might have thought, "Yeah, that's if you don't eat with your right hand, then you're definitely not trained up." And and Krishna's carrying a, a yogurt and rice in his left hand, right? <coughs> hmm. He's carrying ca- carrying the bhakta. Bhakta means boiled rice, and bhakta means devotee. Hmm. And he'll hold on to me. Left hand, right hand, he won't let go. You can't get away from him. It's not possible. If you think you can get away from him, you do not understand him at all. If you say that Krishna is the supreme enjoyer, right? 
Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam. He's Rasa Raj. Hmm? He's the king of Rasa, the supreme enjoyer. But you think that his devotees in Vaikuntha or Goloka can get away, can leave him. Hmm? Then you don't understand what it means that he's the supreme enjoyer. Because he's not just enjoying alone. His the entirety of his enjoyment as Rasaraj is the interaction as the object of love with the shelter of that love. Not only that, we sing often Bhaktivinoda Thakur's song, Nam Kirtan, Rasa Rasika. Hmm? Come, he comes in the song, Rasa Rasika. He's saying, Krishna is Rasa, Krishna is Rasika. We often hear Krishna is Rasa. And he entered the, the arena of Kamsa and different people saw him in different ways and all the twelve Rasas are represented there, the five primary and seven secondary. They all saw him in different ways. There's a nice verse in the Lita Madhava of Rupa Goswami also that he cites at the end of the eighth chapter, fourth wave, eighth chapter, very near the end of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, his own verse explaining the same thing. Hmm? How Krishna is tasting tastes all the rasas. Therefore, he's this is this is what it means. He swayam Bhagwan. This is the Gaudi way of explaining why Krishna is the source of all manifestations of divinity because he tastes all rasas. Hmm? He's Rasa Raj. Akila Rasa Amrita Murti. That's how this Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu begins. But a very after Rupa Goswami's verse from Leita Madhava that he cites near the end, as I'm saying, of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which is a parallel verse to the Bhagavatam verse describing Krishna entering into the arena of Kamsa and being seen in so many ways, verses demonstrating that he's Rasaraj, that he is the object of love for all rasas, hmm? that he can taste love from devotees in all the different rasas. The next verse, and the end ver- last verse of that, describes him as Rasika, and how he is tasting love, and he is the Ashrai, and for him, the devotee is the Vishai. Hmm? So for Krish- Krishna is tasting love, both as the, as, the, as the object of love, and from the other side, hmm, as well. The point is this, Krishna being the supreme enjoyer means that his in, the enti- entirety of his enjoyment is derived from his interaction with his devotees. He's all attractive, and he's the, t- the fullest taster of, uh, of rasa. If his devotees in rasa with him can leave him, the implication is he is defective. Hmm? His rasa, now his ability to taste is, is limited. It's a defect in him, do you understand? Hmm? His pleasure is entirely derived from the devotees. If the relationship between him and his devotees is such that the devotees can give him up at some point, hmm? for whatever reason someone can come up with in their fertile brain that has, with all their analogies and logic, that's just completely contradictory to the scripture, hmm? the implication of it is that how can you say Krishna is the supreme uh, enjoyer? He's a relative enjoyer. Hmm? He can enjoy to a point with that devotee, but that devotee can leave him. Then his jo- enjoyment will be diminished. Hmm? He's not the full enjoyer. Hmm? See, this is a very big issue. Uh, if, you say, if, you, if you insist, they, 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 they fall from, from there. Then you're, you're actually offending Rasaraj himself. You're offending the devotees. It sits in a offense to criticize the residents of the Dham. We follow, as Ragmarg Bhaktas, we follow the Ragatmikas, the Lalita, Vishaka, Subal, Sridham, Sudam, Raktak, Patrak, Nanda, Yashoda. For us it's Sakiras or Madhurya Rasa. So we follow the Ragatmikas, the Nitisiddha Ragatmikas. If they can fall down, what, what, what kind of, who's that to follow? Hmm? Right? And we, yeah. it, you consider the Dom to be to be temporary. That's a Dom operat also. Hmm? 
Well, I don't think it's temporary. I think it's eternal. I just don't think that staying there is necessarily eternal. You, you don't have once you go there, you might. That makes it like every other planet. Christian says the difference between my planet and all the other planets. He says repeatedly in the Gita is from the other planets, they're basically temporary. Residence there is temporary. There's a temporal prospect hmm, to all of those. Hmm. We say, well, it, it's it's in Vaikunt, it's it's not everybody, but some. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't. I'm sorry, it doesn't work. It's a Dalma Parad. Hmm? And it's also Dhamma Parad from the point of view of offending the devotees. And it's, it's uh, so, at any rate, uh, a little sidetrack there. But uh, mm, um, well, I explained Rasa. He, he tastes Rasa and, 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 uh, from both sides. He's tasting Rasa as the Ashrai and he's tasting Rasa as the Vishai, as the object of love. And the devotees are the object of love. Um, for him, the other side. So, um, but uh, we were talking about Brahma, and Brahma offended the form of Bhagawan, and uh, and and he's thinking, you know, is this him? He's not there with the Gyan Mudra, very sophisticated Upanishadic in his speech and so forth. He's holding in his left hand. He's out of form. Hmm? He's out of character hmm? from the point of view. Of, but this is a, this is a, this is a, he, this this holding that yogurt and rice. He, Symbolizes how how tightly he holds his devotees he, through the whole of this uh, lila. What happened, of course, is that uh, Brahma thought he stole the calves, and then he thought he stole the coward boys, hmm? but he only stole mayak facsimiles of those that were created to let him think like that. Hmm? And the calves and the coward boys entered into a particular prakash, a certain window, compartment hmm, of the of the Leela, and it just perpetuated for a whole year. Hmm? And what happened in that one year? Hmm? About two minutes of time passed in one year. Hmm? Krishna what was left the boys to find the calves, right? Hmm? And, when, and, and he was very reluctant to leave the boys because he thought, if I leave their happiness in picnicking, which is what we planned the night before, it will be, it will be, it will be dampened, their enthusiasm. So he said, please to eat, be happy. Hmm? I'll be right back. And, and, I'm, and he's taking the, the rice and yogurt and the fruit with him. I'm eating too. You know, I'm going to go there and get them and and so he disappears for a moment and he comes back with the calves and that took a year hmm? in that compartment meanwhile outside of that compartment in another compartment hmm, in another prakash then Krishna manifests himself as all the coward boys and all the calves and went on with the Leela for about a year hmm? and there he's manifesting himself so he, he's not interacting with this, with this Rup Shakti, it's a little troublesome for him. Hmm? Brahma created some trouble hmm? to teach him. Anyway, so, uh, so Brahma thought what he did, and and he thought he didn't understand at first. Krishna's holding the rice. Hmm? He looks out of out of out of character, out of form. But he's teaching that I I, I love my devotees. Hmm? That's what it's about. I said devotees should love me hmm, because I love them. Sadhunam mridayam mayam. They are my heart. I am their heart. Hmm, right? They are the Swarup Shakti Ananda hmm, that, it, that exceeds the Ananda, my, my Swarup Ananda. Hmm. So he's, he's very subtly teaching this to Brahma. At the dawn of creation, he taught him with four verses. As Krishna... He's teaching uh, things that are different in Golok. There are hand signals and and things uh, how how it should go and what should happen and so forth. Parokshabad is manifest in even in 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 in, in physical caricatures and uh, Parokshabad means indirect speech. Krishna says in the Gita, I, I or Bhagavatam, I like this indirect speech. It's like that speech by which 
you know, like very subtly, you got the point, and you you don't want them to, oh yeah, that's what you you just yeah, that's good. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> It's like so indirect, indirect, and this is, of course, very much the way in which it, the, the, the language of love. The guru has to speak the language of love. Practically speaking, he or she also has to speak the language of logic. He has to translate the language of love into the language of logic. Logic should be, and reason should be, the language that humans speak. Hmm? They should listen to reason. Hmm? That's one of my biggest faults. Hmm? And I continue to commit this grave error. What is that? That I continue to think that unreasonable people will listen to reason if I just present it to them. Hmm? It's quite a frustrating experience to, <laughs> that, they, that they don't. Hmm? But th- this is human life. Hmm? It's just, just to rise above the limitations of, of just language and, and then thought and reason. And so the guru has to speak the language of reason that we might be then rise above our emotional, mental, emotional life hmm? and become sober, become dira, hmm? right? Steady, hmm? objective, and know the truth. I mean, even everybody in the world feels that objectivity is the way is the way to find out the truth isolate the environment make the experiment get the data just follow the facts wherever they take us hmm? we won't believe something we just follow the facts and then ah it will be revealed scientists has to be objective but you cannot be objective as objective by putting on a white coat as you can by putting on a white dhoti <laughs> you can become very objective because now you have to become personally not detached just at work with regard to a particular thing but regard to everything hmm? you have to step back just one half step from the whole world and look at it through eyes of the scripture rather than your own eyes hmm? right and then reason about that and its implications and so forth. So who's more objective, a yogi or a, or a scientist? Who's more detached? You understand what I'm saying? Objectivity comes from detachment. I'm not going to just do whatever I feel or think. Hmm? Hmm. So, and janiyati asu vairagyam jnanam chayra hoitukam. And bhakti, through bhakti, knowledge and detachment come very quickly. Don't think that because you're not sitting in a cave, naked, hmm, that you're less detached as a devotee. Uddhava said, and this is our renunciation. We will wear the vestments of Krishna. Uddhava and Dwarka. When Krishna would hand down one of his two-armed outfits, hmm, hmm, I'm tired of this outfit, then Uddhava would wear it. He's wearing royal clothes of the prince of Dwarka. It's very silk, very fancy. This is our renunciation. Hmm? And he's wearing the, the loincloth and the kopan hmm? and fasting. And we are feasting on the remnants of Krishna, wearing his worn out vestments. Hmm? The implication is what? I am a sold out servant of Krishna. If I don't get his clothes, I'll go naked. Hmm? That's how attached to him I am. I will only wear what he has handed down. Hmm? I'll only eat after he's eaten whatever's left over. Hmm? And I'll cook all day for him and sew all day for him and clean all day for him. Hmm? That is a serving ego. The serving ego includes within it detachment. Hmm? But simply cultivating detachment, which is the culture in Gyan, hmm, does not involve necessarily serving. You can stop taking, which is part of love, but it doesn't constitute in and of itself loving. Right? 
But loving includes not taking. So serving, what's a better way to do away with the, in, the false enjoying ego, which is a taker? To try to stop taking when that's how you're, what you're addicted, what you're addicted to, mm-hmm. or, or, rather than to stop taking, to serve and and give to the one who owns everything, everything. Mm-hmm. In other words, it's harder to serve really mm-hmm. uh, than to than to become detached, than than, than to than to cultivate detachment. Hmm? If I can't have it, fine. I'll sit in the corner. Hmm? It's easier to sit in the corner than it is to, to do. You know, I'll be prepared to go to jail. It's harder to do the right thing, right? To conform. Hmm? That there is an authority. There is a, there is a proprietor, and bring everything to him. Oh, I got to bring everything to him. I wanted to bring everything to myself, but I realized I couldn't. So forget it then. I'll do nothing. Hmm? And you, you got to bring everything to him. Well, that's worse than bringing everything to me. I just gave that up. I gave up giving everything to me. Now I got to get up and give everything to him and get nothing out of it. At least I'm going to sit here and I won't have to do any work. This is the Ghani's perspective. I don't have to do any work. At least I got some out of it. I got to relax. Hmm? And devotees are busy, 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 right? What is the verse? The difference between calm and prem, Krishnendriya Prithivancha, Atmendriya Prithivancha. So love of the of the of the self, hmm? that is karma, and Krishnendriya Prithivancha, hmm? and love of Krishna's senses, that is priti, that is that is that is prem. Hmm? It looks similar. It's, if you want to cry, you've got to perspire. Hmm? If you want to weep for Krishna, you have to work for Krishna. <laughs> then first weep, first work, then weep, right? Hmm? Weep, weep, because when you work for Krishna, when you serve, then you'll weep because you'll be realizing the work, the giving is the getting, the giving is the receiving. I want to, now bhakti only for bhakti. Hmm? So yes, Brahma was uh, Krishna was Krishna was not uh, um, speaking Upanishadic language. He was acting what seemed to be out of out of character, and this is he's now in the land of love. Hmm? Love is the rule. Love is the rule here. Hmm? Where there's love, there are no laws. Where there's laws. There's, there's, there's no love. Mm-hmm. And he's teaching Brahma subtly, holding the rice. I never let go of my devotee. I can't let, let go of them, him, mm-hmm. her, ever. Mm-hmm. Not possible. Mm-hmm. So uh, Krishna's attachment to his devotees, the devotees' attachment to him, and so forth. So at any rate, he makes a subtle offense, and he had to take birth outside of, of the Hindu form, outside of the Varnashram, with all its rules. Hmm? And what was his position in Gaur Lila, Nama Charja? The name stayed with him. Hmm? So he offended the form, but the name stayed with him. right? And in no uncertain terms. Indeed, by his Nam Bhajan, from the Ragmarg side, as we said the other day, he called Krishna to come as Mahaprabhu, whereas Advaita Prabhu called him through Vidimarg of Archan. Hmm? So Haridas, as Brahma Haridas, he got acquainted with the, the ideal there, and he got his reaction hmm, for offending the form, but the name stayed with him. So this is the point we ended with in our last discussion. The, the name stayed with him. Hmm? Uh, so so. Uh, generous is the name. This is what Mahaprabhu speaks about in the second sloka of Shikshastakam. Hmm? Right? He says, Nananuraga, the name is very generous, is sh- is filled with all the shaktis, all his internal shakti, it's full, full power of his Surup Shakti Ananda, perf- capable of not only dispelling Maya, but, but, but overwhelming Krishna. Krishna means 
the absolute overwhelmed by bhakti. Hmm? Hmm. And Mahaprabhu said, but I don't have any attraction. So, uh, nananurag. Why is the reason? Durdaivam. Nananurag. Durdaivam means some anartha. An artist from offense will be have greater ramifications. But, again, the offenses to the form of the Lord, which we may incur, for example, in deity worship, there are 32 offenses, and, and, and then there are another 34 after them in other, in other Puranas and so forth. So many. So, if you make those offenses... Then, you then the teaching is what the name. This is offense to the named, but the name will stay with you. And by chanting the name, those offenses can be overcome. Hmm. So typically, then our form of deity worship in Gaudi Vaishnavism, which is centered on Nam Kirtan, is always full of always uttering the names. Idam Nabijam Om Glim Ramakrishna Bhim Namaha, and so on. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, by by nam by nam kirtan and other forms of kirtan also, you can overcome. You can before they can germinate and 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 flower. Mm-hmm. Offenses committed to to the deity can be canceled out. Mm-hmm. So this sounds great. Mm-hmm. Therefore. We don't have to learn 32 offenses. We can just make them and chant. If you think like that, though, the problem is what? The, the problem is that you're... That's right. It means that you're... Now your uh, offense to the form has become an offense to the name. Because the principle is that there's, there's an offense to the name that... that, that Basically, that if you think that by, because the name has the power to rectify, if you sin, then you can chant. Then on the strength of the name, you can sin and there'll be no problem. Hmm? This is an offense. And Vishnu Chakritaka explains, this carries out through all, in all realms within the religious um, life. In other words, uh, it's not just, if you if you think, um, oh, I can commit this sin within the realm of karma, and by this piety I can overcome it, then you're making offense in that realm also. Hmm? So if you think, oh, if I offend the deity, I can just chant, so I don't have to learn about how to serve the deity properly, no problem, hmm? and I keep making offenses, then those offenses to the form of God suddenly become offenses to the name. Hmm? And now what are you going to do if the name has the power to mitigate and um, remedy offenses to the form? How are we going to overcome offenses to the name? We've gotten to the full end here of the problems that we have to deal with. We may have offended the name. if, In fact, if we chant and without any feeling... If healing doesn't come, then there must be offenses in the background because we see people chant and they do get the feeling. If it's not coming in us, then it must be we have some offense in the background. Hmm. Hmm. Offense to the name. How are we going to overcome that? By the name we may get rid of karma, by an abbas we may get some karma, by... Uh, by chanting name with faith, get rid of parabdha karma. Hmm. We can overcome offenses to the form of the Lord. But what about the name itself? Now the most merciful and powerful form of the expression of the Lord that's helping us in all these ways, we're offending that. You see, now the scale on the offense has just reached its, its zenith. How will we overcome? Well, where else are you going to turn is the point. If you fall on the ground, you have to use the ground to get up. Hmm? Right? There's nothing lower than that. Hmm? You, you you bottomed out here. So, you, so if you offend the name, we've already learned from the very first verse, there's nothing higher than the name. 
Right? It's now different than Krishna himself. And if there is a difference, he's more merciful than Krishna. So, now if you offend the name, who are you going to go to? Who, who's higher than the name to exonerate you from the offense? The name. There's nobody higher. So you have to take shelter of the name. Hmm? And the name itself, through chanting, will, in due course, uh, dissipate the reactions to offenses in the past. Hmm? But there's a spirit that Baladev speaks about in his commentary on the Namastakam, Baladev Bidjibhusan, with which that chanting should um, be done. And that is with this spirit, that I am not, I will not commit any offenses now. I have some bandhagyan. I know what the offenses are. There are ten offenses to the name. Hmm? And Let's just highlight one of them, the, the worst of them, Sadhu Ninda, to offend Sadhu. That's the worst of them. Why is it the worst? Because if you offend uh, Krishna, your bhakti will be, could be stunted, the growth, for some time. But it'll come back. But if in in having attained bhava bhakti, hmm, you make a serious offense to a superlative Vaishnav, your bhava can go away. Hmm. So the power in the wrong direction derived from Vaishnav aparad is greater than the power in the wrong direction derived from offending Bhagwan. Hmm. It's just the opposite is true too, right? You please Krishna more by pleasing his devotee than pleasing him. Therefore, he says, if you want to please me, please my devotee. Those who say they are a devotee are not my devotee. Those who say they are the devotee of my devotee, they are my devotees. So we know that. So the opposite is also true. Hmm. So this, therefore, this offense is is often highlighted. It's often highlighted also because with Sambandagyan, we can learn about the different offenses. And so one of the offenses, for example, is uh, not to think that the name of Krishna is, chanting is in Sankirtan, the, the yogya of, of, the, of the age and so forth, is like uh, a, another Vedic ritual. Hmm? Now, it would be pretty hard for you to make that offense, right? There are subtle ways in which you might. Hmm? You might think, without this particular ritual, if I don't do it right, then, then it's, it's going to be a problem. When we installed Krishna and Balaram in, 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 in Vrindavan, it was a three-day affair. Hmm? And priests were coming in all the time, chanting mantras and doing things and so forth. The prophet was in his room. Every now and then there would be some function for the acharya, who was prophet to come out, put a tulsi leaf, go back in his room and so forth. When it's all done, and this is this is this is... Not the karma mark, but this is you know within um, really coming from Vaidhi Bhakti, hmm? uh, all this all these procedures for installing the deity. And what is the deity? The form of Krishna Balaram that we see in Vrindavan. Where does that come from? You have to understand that form never appeared in the world before. It's coming right from the heart of Prabhupada, Balaram leaning on the shoulder of Krishna, Krishna with his hand on his on his hip. Uh, holding his flute like this, and Balaram leaning on him, and Prabhupada thinking, who is stronger, Krishna or Balaram? Hmm? If it's Balaram, why is he leaning on Krishna's shoulder? Hmm? So, <laughs> a person who can feel that, really feel that, hmm? then from his heart, the deity came outward. Hmm? And then for everybody else, they're pouring water on him, making sure he's there, you know. He came from the heart of that form. I'm saying that 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 um, configuration. You know, it's not that there's Krishna and Balaram, D, different prophets. Said, Let's make one like that. Hmm? That particular form that comes right from Prabhupada's heart. Hmm? Hmm. And he would speak about it in charming ways, as as I mentioned. Hmm? So this is what the, really the deity worship is. The heart of the charya is, is expanded externally that devotees can take advantage. Hmm.
right? In the form they can handle. So, uh, what was the point now? So, uh, so they did all these yagis. It took like three days, and, and then after it was over, we did kirtan and Prabhupada said, actually, just by the kirtan, everything was perfect. All that stuff was just show to please everybody else who thought you got to do it like this, you got to do it like. If you don't do it like this, there's going to be a problem. Hmm? Just by kirtan, uh, our kirtan. And we, of course, we would have been wise to say, just by you, <laughs> you, you are that you are. Just by looking at you, we do kirtan. Hmm? It said the superlative. It said that uh, the superlative Vaishnava is one who, upon seeing him, hmm, one begins to chant Hare Krishna. I used to say, without seeing him, people began chanting Hare Krishna. Like, without seeing him, temples opened in Central America. Hmm? Without seeing him, temples opened in Canada. You know, I, I, in Canada, I know in Vancouver, there was a temple. 300 devotees, Prabhupada never went there. They were all chanting ecstatically at four every morning. Hmm? It is a very extraordinary uh, devotee. Hmm? <laughs> That's just very very mind, mind-boggling. Hmm? Um, so, um, so, so the so and Sudula Bhagavata is okay. So the devo- great devotee, we should be careful not to offend the devotee, hmm? right? Um, and um, so this offense can be highlighted. But uh, if you offend such a devotee, even in Bhava, then you may lose you lose your Bhava. It's possible. Hmm? Uh, in pleasing the devotee, you will please Krishna more. So this is Vaishnavism. Hmm? So we should be careful about these offenses. We should learn them. When we learn them, of course, you're not going to, many of them, I think this is the point I was making, you learn, oh, this yagya to stall the deity, for example, in the kirtan yagya, is like uh, the same as a uh, horse yagya or something, you know, for which you want to get uh, to become indra. They're not equal. To think they're equal is to commit a namaparad. Hmm? Now it's pretty hard to commit that one, right? If you get, if you just hear about it, you learn it. So some, the knowledge, some bandhagyan, can help you avoid the offenses. But there are subtle ways that you could make such an offense by way of thinking. Certain things are essential, hmm? um, uh, like like f- from within the, the, the broader periphery in which Vaishnavism appeared, for example, within the Varnashram. Dharma, hmm? and then you might think, oh, certain things from Varnashram is, are required to do, otherwise your bhakti will be inhibited, or if you don't do them, your bhakti will be affected negatively. You start to verge on these type of offense. So that, yeah, so you really, you really have to think. I used to think when I used to do book distribution. Sometimes I would just go through the offenses, and I would just think how I'm committing every offense. There must be a way I'm committing, or have committed every offense. I've learned this one, you know. Uh, and, and I don't do it overtly, but there must be some subtle way that I'm doing that. Hmm? So then you get a deeper understanding of the, all the implications and so forth. Still, for the most part, you can avoid many of them. But the Vaishnava Parad, you know about it. Still, we are, it's difficult for us not to not to make offense. Hmm? Someone, uh, you know, we, we resist our own our own self-interest. Unfortunately, that's just the nature of our material. Uh, conditioning. So, at any rate, mm-hmm. the point here in the seventh verse of Namastakam is that these offenses to the name can be overcome by chanting the name, but the spirit with which one should chant in order to accomplish that is, I'm not going to commit any offenses to the name. Hmm? In the present, I'm so I'm going to seriously take Take the take, take uh, chant the name, and in that spirit, then gradually, gradually, and suddenly, then it, they'll they'll pass, they'll pass, and again, opening and enthusiasm and, and taste will come, and so forth. Hmm? So this is uh, you know you have to be a sadhaka. We're doing something all the time. We don't realize we're actually doing yoga all the time if we understand it properly. Hmm? I look like I'm doing this, I look like I'm doing that, but it's all, I'm doing sadhana. Hmm? Uh, it's a whole, 
life lifestyle, right? So, at any rate, the point tonight is what that that nam aparad itself can be overcome by nam, hmm? and then Rupa Goswami ends in Amastakam um, with I'll read it verse eight, okay? Um, maybe I should, it's a little late, huh? I should. Verse eight. <laughs> Verse eight, and we'll. Well, I mean, I won't speak long on this, but he says that, O oh Krishna, name, O oh enlivener of Narada's vena, O oh Harinam, whose overwhelming sweetness is like the concentrated juice of the multitudes of waves of nectar, kindly sport freely and lovingly on my tongue. I don't think I even read verse 7, which is what we talked about tonight. <laughs> I'll read that. He says, O Harinam, o, o Krishna, I offer my repeated obeisances unto you, who are the all-pervasive entity that destroys the multitudes of suffering of the surrendered souls. That phrase right there is what speaks about its ability to to do away with the offenses to the name, as well as everything else that's been mentioned previously. The, the personification of delightful, concentrated spiritual bliss, the great cause, the cause of great celebrations in Gokul. So he's done, done a nice thing in this verse with, with, his, with his poetry, Rupa Goswami. He says that, again, that the name can um, um, uh, chanting the name, by the chanting the name we can overcome offenses to the name and and that means that all of what's been spoken about in the past and more as far as removing the negative to our pursuit of prem name can do and then he and he 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 he's he glorifying the name and he says uh, that you are the personification of delightful concentrated bliss and the great cause of celebrations in gokul so the implication of this it, 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 he says that by doing away with all these negatives hmm, in the course of chanting, you're in a position to come to the positive of Prem. The characteristics of Prem Bhakti are Sandranatma Visheshatma and Krishna Akarshani. So it, 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 he describes Krishna as concentrated, delightful, concentrated bliss. This is Sandranatma Visheshatma. It's the quality of, 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 of Prem Bhakti that Krishna corresponds with that it makes the bliss of Brahman hmm, seem insignificant in comparison. And people are uh, lying on a bed of nails to get the bliss of, of, of Brahman. Hmm. It's an insignificant thing compared to the bliss of Prem. So uh, Rupa Goswami, of course, described this in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu in the very first chapter. And the second characteristic of Prem Bhakti that Krishna corresponds with as the object of that Prem Bhakti is what? Well, he says here he's the great cause of celebrations in Gokul. So it's, it's a, in a sense a way of saying that he he's Krishna. It's, that Prem is Krishna Akarshani. It conquers conquers Krishna. Hmm? And all of the goings on which is a constant celebration where again, the walking is, is dancing and the talking is singing and there is singing, and there is dancing, and the constant festival uh, and vibration of his names um, that uh, speaks to us about his um, the power of Prem, hmm, Prem Nam, to conquer Krishna. And then he concludes again by saying, O oh, Krishna Nam, so he, he specifies at the end, Krishna Nam, is the best name of Krishna. And as there's many statements in the scripture to this effect. He refers to Narada. This is where Bhagi Milatakura's song, Narada Muni Bajai Vina Radhika Ramana Name comes from. This is some he, from the last verse of Namastakam. I think he must have a song for every every verse in Namastakam. Bhakti Vinotakura ki jai. Harinam Prabhu ki jai. Rupa Goswami Prabhupada ki jai. Gaur Radha Madhava ki jai. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki jai. Gaur Premanand.